Okay, so I'm going to talk about how to contribute to SageMap Cloud, starting now. So the goal of the talk is more or less to explain how to work on SageMath Cloud. Um, I'll say a little bit about what SageMath Cloud is and how it's constructed in the next 10 minutes. Um, the main problem is right now I do around 95% of SageMath Cloud development. So if you, I looked at the Git log recently and out of the 9,763 commits in the Git log for SageMath Cloud, uh, 9,340 have, have me listed as the author, which is a pretty uh, large percentage. And then if you look at the actual lines using, um, so you basically start with something that gives you the git blame information, and then you pipe it into Stack Overflow, and you get <laughs> um, a listing. And these are the lines that I modified versus other people. So it's pretty depressing. And uh, my goal is that this stops, and uh, I'm not the only one doing development on SMC. Because uh, my experience with doing lots of software development on one thing is that you kind of get burned out at some point. And if suddenly I stop working on SMC, and nobody else knows how to work on it, and nobody else works on it, then it will completely die for sure. Um, and that might not be desirable. Okay, what is SMC? I started it in April 2013. I was teaching a course, and um, I launched the first version, which I wrote over a couple of weeks before this time. Um, and then I started running it on a desktop in my office. And the course was just a general introduction to Sage and LaTeX and mathematical computation. And so I wanted uh, some collaborative environment that people could use for that course to do LaTeX and other things. Um, it currently runs on nearly 20 VMs that are at Google, and it has a lot of users. Um, we can take a look at the live usage right now. Um, if you click on the help screen, it gives you some information. There's 779 users logged in, signed in right now. Uh, and then there's some other statistics like 654 projects were modified in the last hour, 3,500 in the last day, etc. And a little over 30,000 projects modified in the last month. And then real-time data, if you want to see uh, where people are using it from, this is what it looks like. So right now it's apparently mostly Europe. The, yeah, and then sometimes there's afternoon computer labs. If you want to see what they're doing, um, there's like the top, uh, some of the top uh, projects that are being modified right now. So one of them is in Russian and other stuff, some IPython notebook things, Sage worksheets, etc. And this updates um, at least once per minute in real time. You don't have to refresh or anything. Uh, that sounds good. Okay, the features are uh, real-time collaboration in the, I mean, not in the sense of like, you know, an engineer talks about real-time, just that it's not like Git. What's wrong? Oh, it's stupid. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, pause. It's really, really, I don't know how. How Preview still has that as a default. It's insane. Okay, um, so real-time collaboration. You can edit LaTeX documents, Sage worksheets, R, you can, use, you can write R code or use R in Sage worksheets or in terminals. Um, you can use Jupyter Notebooks, color terminals. Um, you can write code in a whole bunch of different languages. There's course management functionality. There's chat rooms. There's a lot of stuff in there now. Um, you can also now run it in a single user developer friendly mode, which is what I'm going to talk about today mainly. Uh, the, tech, the tech stack is the following. So a lot of the code is written um, on the back end using Node.js. So it's server-side JavaScript, and the language is, I don't, we don't actually write code in JavaScript directly, but in CoffeeScript, which is, uh, it's a very simple pre-parser, I guess it used to be simple, it's maybe a more complicated pre-parser for JavaScript, kind of like the Sage pre-parser, except for JavaScript. And what they do is they remove all the semicolons and braces. So it looks more like, more like Python. Yeah, or rather you can write it to look more like Python, maybe. Um, it also has, instead of having to write out Function uh, you know, like a comma b, which is what you would write in JavaScript. You can write in CoffeeScript 
a, b, and then you put the um, function inside. So there's some slight notation that's a little easier to use than this when writing the office. Though in um, ECMAScript 6, so the most recent version of JavaScript, there's at least a double arrow function, which is similar to this, which you can now use in like Chrome debugger and stuff. Um, in any case, that's what we use a lot of. Uh, it but means there's a lot less code. What? You can also leave out all the parentheses. We do not leave out the parentheses except, so if you're just calling a, when you call a function in um, CoffeeScript, <clears throat> you can optionally leave off the parentheses and simply write um, F A B A comma, well, you can write F A comma B and not put parentheses in. And uh, there are cases where that actually looks really good and sensible, and there are cases where it doesn't. And um, when you write JavaScript with lots of asynchronous callbacks, you discover that there are certain situations where this is this uh, leaving off parentheses for function calls is extremely nice. And there are other situations where it isn't. And so um, in our style, we do that in some cases. Hello. And in other cases, we don't. So the answer is not at all as simple as yes or no. Um, but for a single line function call, typically, you keep the parentheses, even though you don't have to in CoffeeScript. But it's actually immensely helpful to leave off the parentheses, um, because very often, when you're writing JavaScript, you end up in a situation where you have something, and you want to pass in a function that you define right there. And if you have to include parentheses, you end up with sort of a parentheses sort of sitting there at the very, very end of a long block, and it's hard to keep track of. Um, writing code in JavaScript or for JavaScript is completely different in almost every possible way to writing code for Python. The language is, a, is designed to solve completely different problems, and it, it's just an extremely different tool than Python. It's much more like using Twisted, where you never, ever do anything with like, Twisted seems really weird, right, if you've ever used it. But JavaScript is like Twisted, with only Twisted stuff. What? You had a question? Does it say callback and callback? Like Callbacks. We don't use promises at all. But we use the async, the async library a lot. So you just have a sequence of function calls, like async.series, async.parallel, etc. Um, for the... Persistent WebSocket connection, we use Nginio and Primus, which is a more modern, more flexible alternative to Socket.io, which is maybe a little more popular, because it was the first, or Soc.js. This one's good because you can plug in different backends. What this does is it lets you establish a persistent connection between a client and a server and have push messages in both directions. Uh, for the user interface, we use about 50% is written using React.js and the other 50% is written using jQuery and just standard HTML type stuff. And uh, that should change to a much larger percent written in React and a smaller percent written the other way. We've been rewriting it to use React. React is, um, uh, well, it's hard to describe in one sentence because it's a bit, I mean, it's a new idea about how to do single page application web development, which is completely different than what everybody did until a year ago. So. Um, because it's completely different, it's a little bit difficult to describe in a sentence. The basic idea behind it, though, is that in the old days, you would write, um, of course, people still do this a lot now, but you might write an application where you use templates to generate pages on the server, and when a person visits a given page, it renders that template. What React.js does is make it so you can write code like that, but purely in the browser, and you write your code as if you're generating the entire page, and what uh, React does is it computes a diff between what the actual browser is displaying and what you want the next version of the page to look at look like, and then it mutates the um, page accordingly. And then um, the people that wrote React had a lot of test use, had a lot of users to test this on to figure out what they should optimize, and they had a lot of test code. Namely, it's Facebook that wrote it, and um, they kind of have like over a billion users every day or something, um, so they could test things pretty well. Um, I'll show you some React code later. The database is RethinkDB. It's a scalable JSON. It's like a um, document database. So you store documents, which are JSON objects in it. Uh, it has pretty sophisticated query support. Like you can do map reduce. You can do really subtle queries that run um, various operations on the data. You can build really, really sophisticated indexes on your data. 
You can also scale as horizontally in that you can just add new nodes and it'll shard your data across the nodes and replicate it. You can specify for each table individually exactly how it gets sharded and replicated. Um, it also has a, a unique feature in that you can subscribe to a query. So you say, I'd like the, um, like all user or I like all projects with the following IDs. And then I'd like, it, I'd like you to send me updates whenever anything changes about them. And so it pushes update notifications about changes in the state of the system. Um, Sage, everybody knows, here knows what Sage is. Jupyter Notebooks are also part of uh, Sage Math Cloud. They're embedded in there. Um, Webpack is a tool that takes lots of JavaScript, HTML, CSS, images, SAS files, whatever. Um, pretty much any language that, in, that you use to develop something that would be in a web page and bundles it all together and compresses it. And it will also divide up the um, page that you're serving so that into what are called code splits. So it'll serve sort of the part of the page you need just to see the landing page. And then when you open some editor that maybe involves another megabyte of code, it'll then and only then actually download that additional code. So it breaks things up into chunks and then um, loads things asynchronously. And then of course LaTeX is sort of appears all over their place on the front end and the back end in a sense in MathJax and, and Linux and so on. So that's the stack. Um, as far as contributing to SMC goes, everything is on GitHub. That's the GitHub repo. Um, you can do Sage develop Sage Math Cloud development either in an SMC project or um, on your own laptop or VM running Linux or OS X. And all the code that you contribute to SMC has to be GPL v3 compatible, but you can contribute under any license as long as it's compatible with this, and you can keep your copyright if you want. Okay, so first I'm going to um, go through these steps, which should take about 15 minutes. Uh, I'm going to do this in the project called SD70, so you could either just watch what I do in there, or if you wanted to try this on your own computer or in your own project, you're welcome to do that. It'll take about 15 minutes. But what this will do is um, set up a complete self-contained SageMath Cloud development environment where you can make changes to SMC itself. So if you want to do this on your own computer, um, there, well, step one is in SMC, open a project or create a project and then open it. On your own computer, it's necessary to install Node.js version 5 and rethink DB. And um, neither of these are going to be just sort of like apt to install something that's already in Debian because Node.js version 5 was released you know, two weeks ago. Yeah. Rethink DB, the current version was released um, like a month ago. And so you have to install the, their sources for Debian. Yeah, exactly. You have, they do have, they both do have Debian packages. It's just that you they're in their own places. Um, they're, of course, pre-installed in SMC system-wide, so you just use what's already there. Um, another thing which I hadn't ever had trouble with before but when we tested on Harold's laptop is the default Python command should be Python 2 rather than Python 3. You know, on Harold's laptop, it's Python 3. So that causes trouble. Okay, so once you've done that, I, once you have Node.js installed, the next step is to clone this repository. So I'm going to do that in the SD70 project. And again, you can just watch me if you open the SD70 project. Um, so I'm just going to make a terminal at the top called William talk dot term. So the website of Node.js seems to claim that version 4.2 is the latest. Well, they're incorrect because 5.0 is the, the latest. <coughs> I don't think I'm using any. 4.2 is the latest LTS release. Yeah, yeah, but it's like if you go to the... Well, have, it's not my fault. They're wrong. wrong. There you are. So, 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 so <laughs> we, sometimes yeah, we claim the latest stage releases. Yeah, no, they have a difference between LTS and stage. Yeah. So yeah. In, in, in the SC70 project, you can copy paste. Yes, yeah. Okay, I'm doing this right now in this project, but again, if you just created another project, you could do this yourself or in any project you have. Um, and the talk itself is under that I'm giving. If you wanted to copy paste things out of it, in the in this project there's W Stein talks SMC development and then there's um, 
There's a markdown file or the tech file. The markdown file is easier to copy paste out of. I made a markdown file and then from that made a tech file. Okay, so the first step is to git clone the repository. The second step is that uh, development this way isn't, um, I haven't pushed it to master yet since I've been making a lot of tweaks in the last few days and I don't want to break master. So what you have to do is check out the SMC in SMC branch because what we're going to do is run Sage, a complete SageMath Cloud install inside of a single SageMath Cloud project. So that's why it's called SMC and SMC. Okay, so I've now checked out that branch. The next step is to go into the source directory, to subdirectory, and if you look there, there's there's some things. There's an, um, a script right here that you have to source in order to set up the environment. And then you type npm run make. So um, there's so in Node.js there's a file package.json, which uh, I'll open it before I before I start the make. Let me start the the make running because this will take a while. This should take about I don't know eight to ten minutes. It's going to download a large number of Node.js packages and install them. Some of them are just JavaScript. Some of them involve um, compilation, etc. So package JSON, that's the Node.js analog of setup.py in the Python world. And what it does is it specifies information about your package, the dependencies that your package has, just like in setup.py, you specify dependencies. Uh, and then they use semantic versioning, and there's some notation that explains how these version numbers correspond. Or, uh, what versions are allowed to match these version numbers. Um, there's some scripts. So when I said npm run make, this is the line that it ran, which is actually just an alias for this for running the script smc install all. And what that script does is for each of the different um, modules of smc, and there's a, bunch, there's a couple of them, it does npm install inside of those, which installs all their dependencies. And each of those could have 50 dependencies, and each of those can install lots of dependencies. So it's a <coughs> pretty complicated process. Um, also, all this dependency installation that's going on, um, one thing about Node which is kind of different than Python is you can easily have one running program that could have maybe five different versions of the same library at once running as dependencies of five different things. And this is somehow fully supported. Um, in JavaScript, uh, or in Node.js, modules are much less likely to sort of, at import time, reach into the global scope and do bad things. I mean, they could, they just tend not to. Um, it's very much frowned upon. So I'll let this run. By the way, if you've never seen SageMath Cloud before, this is what it looks like. Um, this is a terminal that's running inside of there. This is the... Uh, PDF that I, it's a PDF of the schedule. Um, here's the H, the markdown editor uh, where you can, basically it shows a preview on the right and on the left it has markdown. And you can do things like clicking this button splits the view. So you can see two different points in the document at once. Or you can split it horizontally, which looks kind of funny when you have so many different things here. Um, you can also make multiple cursors. So you can, on a Mac you do alt, uh, command click, and then you get like a whole bunch of different cursors at once, which is kind of fun. Um, Sage worksheets are the same in that if I open a Sage worksheet, uh, test, so I just opened a Sage worksheet, and um, as before, in a Sage worksheet, you can also create multiple you can work with multiple cursors, so if I do, I can make a cursor at each point and do that. It's kind of silly, but uh, it could be useful. Um, and unlike IPython or Sage Notebooks, you can do things like cut a whole block, paste it back, paste it twice, so now I have two copies of that. And it'll work with 3D graphics even. Um, so let me insert a very complicated 3D plot right here. 
from our documentation. So this is a 3D implicit plot. And I can take and just kind of copy and paste. Well, I'll cut this whole range, make a new worksheet, test two. This could even be in a different project. And then I can paste into that, and it just works. The reason is because it, um, instead of having a complete copy of all of the data to describe every image in the worksheet itself, there's a key value store which um, maps the SHA-1 hash of the data to the actual data. And that's what's embedded in the worksheet, which is much better. Um, OK, let's see how our build is going. It's still going. Again, it should take about um, 8 to 10 minutes. So while this finishes, are there any questions about the architecture of SageMap Cloud? Are you forced into Python 2 because of the tools you're using, or is that how you see it? Um, Python 2 is only used, well, yeah, like Sage. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the reasons that some of the code is in Python 2 is because it's uh, there's a there's a Sage library that provides the a Sage worksheet server. For example. So you actually so you, you still don't write. No. And no. no. Um, there's very little Python. It's just like some startup scripts and, yeah, and so just, just little so utilities. The point is it's Python 2 for transport and management part. So the yeah. global requirement. Yeah, there's lots of little management scripts. If you um, if you take a terminal, let's see. Just grab another terminal here. Well, I'll make a new one. There's a bunch of scripts to start with. Actually, I can just show you. Well, OK, sorry. There's just a bunch of scripts to start with to bug SMC. So if you type SMC tab, you'll see that there's, these are Python 2 scripts. But I mean, there's like a few pages that could, you can rewrite this in Python 3 pretty easily. Um, I did, when I started SMC, I did write it, like, you know, like first prototype in using um, Tornado and Python. I tried to use Python 3. I tried really hard. But I mean, I couldn't get anything to work at all. Like, <laughs> nothing. It was, but that was in 2012. So um, maybe things are good now. I don't know. Uh, OK. As the build is still not quite done, another thing I can show you is just a little quick tour of the source code. So if you, this is the what you get when you get clone the SMC repo. I shall make this a little bigger. So this is what you get when you clone it. There's some markdown files at the top level that explain how development works, um, just sort of overview of the project. There's a very complicated install and defile. This documents exactly how SMC is set up on SMC itself. So this is this describes how to set up SMC if you want to run it where you know you have lots of users coming in from the outside, you want to do it securely. Um, you want to have things like snapshots of projects and all this other stuff. Um, that's, that's not the sort of thing you can just run as one user in, on, in user space on one machine and do it securely. At least I don't know how to do that. Um, oh, sweet. Did it succeed? It did. Uh, okay, I'm going to make this big because I'm on the screen. Okay, so everything succeeded. There's some warnings about, uh, well, what happened here, in case you're curious, is React can, um, React is capable of generating basically stuff that you put in the DOM, either on the front end or the back end. And SMC uses a little of each. And this is generating some React, using React to generate um, some of the pages on the back end. And there's some deprecation warnings because of the, the new version. Well, the ecosystem involving React and some of the related packages is dramatically changing. And one of the main packages that we depend on got abandoned in July. And the guy has disappeared completely. So kind of uh, Flumux, as it's called amusingly, <laughs> has flummoxed this very much. Um, and so there's some deprecations that he will never deal with. And sending him a pull request doesn't work because there's 23 open pull requests against this GitHub repo. I got it running again. On your laptop? Yes. Excellent. Um, no, I can't it's, on my laptop. It's very challenging for him because he has very limited memory. Um, yeah, I'm not uh, Okay, so anyways, let's let's start it up. So there's a subdirectory dev, 
And this has scripts that are helpful for doing development in various contexts. So where it says project, these are scripts that are helpful if you're going to do SMC development in a project on SMC. So it's kind of meta SMC inside of SMC. Um, public is when you're going to do stuff, uh, it's sort of intermediate. So you want to run SMC securely on a single machine. So it's kind of small scale, but it is something you want to open up to the world. So that's where this is relevant. Um, laptop is, well, right now it's Harold's laptop and my laptop. <laughs> And by the way, it does work on OS X. Mm, I'm looking at people in the second row, they don't care. Third row, most people care, but not here. Is anyone using OS X but me and you? Well, we are European. Okay, well, biased, so. yeah. readers out, uh, if I were in a Seattle coffee shop, people would be very excited to hear that you can run everything natively in OS X as well. Um, by everything, I mean you can run SMC, um, not obviously, actually there's no dependencies you can't run natively. Um, but that's what laptop has like stuff to deal with OS 10 and Linux. So it's running now on Harold's laptop and it's not like um, like in a VM or something like that. And then the directory says SMC has some information relevant to running SMC itself. So when I write configuration scripts for SMC itself, that's where I'll put them. Although actually right now I think it only has like one script. Okay, since we're um, in a project inside of SMC and we want to run SMC again, this is the directory we go into. And there's some instructions in the readme file, which are right here. So the short instructions are you do, uh, you can do tmux start all. And what that will do is it will start a tmux, a new tmux session with a couple of different scripts running. And you can just see them all running in the core guy. You can alternatively just open a couple of terminals or use whatever, like screen or whatever you like using, and just start these three separate processes running. They all run in the foreground by default. Um, the idea behind doing that is that you're doing development, so you probably want to see the logs, and you want to be able to very easily hit Control C and just kill things and restart them. Um, so there are no daemons running any here at all. In SMC itself, of course, everything runs as daemons. So let's start it up. Okay, um, you make it a little smaller because there's so many different things. Okay, at the top, it started up a brand new instance of RethinkDB, and the data for RethinkDB is stored in the same directory as where we just started this. In general, you would, you know, in a real deployment, you'd store the data in, in a separate disk or something. But right here is just local completely. This is the address where we're going to go to use our copy of SMC that's inside of SMC. So we'll be able to see what happened. We'll be able to make changes and we'll see the changes here. What this is doing is it's building all the static stuff. So there's a lot of code in CoffeeScript, there's a bunch of HTML, a bunch of SAS files, there's a bunch of dependencies, things like um, MathJax and CodeMirror and all this other stuff. Actually MathJax currently isn't packaged by this, but CodeMirror is, and a lot of other stuff. What this does is it walks the entire dependency tree and it takes all that um, JavaScript code and all kinds of other things via plugins and puts it all together into uh, basically one JS JavaScript file. So like all of 3.js, it all gets put into one JavaScript file. But of course that's kind of dumb because maybe you're not going to look at 3D graphics instantly. So um, it breaks it up into a couple of JavaScript files uh, op optionally. So in fact, um, we looked at, I think, 743 different files, um, scripts and stuff, and then it combines them all together in these pieces. And then those get put in a location that gets served statically on the main SMC site that's served via Nginx, but in the development um, environment right here, it's just served directly by Node.js. And then um, what happens is it sits there and it watches for changes to anything. Like if you change some random piece of 3.js, or you change some CoffeeScript code, or you change a SAS file, any sort of thing that you change, it notices that that happened, and then it, within um, usually about three, two to three seconds, it will have updated everything as a result. And then you can refresh your browser and see the changes. It also has support for called hot, what's called hot reloading, where at least for React, when you make changes to React components, it'll build the changes and then push them to the browser over a socket, and then substitute them in and re-render them. And so you don't even have to refresh. But I've not enabled that support yet. But it would be really cool to do so. So that would be useful in some cases. 
The bottom thing is a backend web server and many other, it, this, this is a Node.js process which um, provides WebSocket connections. It also serves static HTML, namely it's serving this stuff up. Um, and it does a few other things. So that's what's running right here. I call that the hub in the file hub.copy. And I'll show you that in a little bit. Okay, so these things are running. When we go to this address, it's going to fail to work. And that's because there's a, um, there's a slight race condition between creating all the indexes and setting up the database and then setting up the WebSocket server. And currently the way to get around that is to stop the hub and then restart it again. And that gets around. This is not something that's a problem at all in production. It's a problem for development. However, um, as of now, uh, I don't think anyone has written any code using development of SMC inside of SMC like this before, like none, except for making this branch to do development this way. So far, all the development's been done by setting up a completely separate VM and then running a complete copy of SMC in that and then using like SSHFS to mount files and um, edit code that way. So we've never, this is um, a slightly more lightweight in a sense and self-contained approach. Okay, I'm gonna go here and it's going to fail and I'll show you how. It doesn't completely fail. It'll load all this static HTML, no problem, but it won't actually successfully log me in. And the reason is, if you look here, is it failed to load a certain resource, namely um, something that involves the word Primus. Uh, what it's doing is it's trying to connect to a backend WebSocket server, and the thing just isn't there. And it's not there because it wasn't initialized when the hub started up um, due to maybe something timing out. And it'll be, there are a list of four issues like this with development. I'll show you a slide that lists all of them. I estimate each one will take me about two hours to fix, and none of them are supposed to be that way, but there's only so much time. Um, so I'm just going to stop this one, and then restart it. This also illustrates how you can just directly start any of these services. So I'll just do start hub, and it starts it up again. It would be nice if when I hit control C, it put me in a shell rather than just closing that pane, but I don't know how to do that in Tmux yet. Um, this whole thing is created by a one-liner where I do Tmux and then some long line and it opens with all of these things running. Okay, now that I've uh, restarted the hub, I should be able to refresh and it should make the WebSocket connection. These are warnings from React. They're deprecation warnings, so they're not a problem, even though they're red. And here we are. We're now connected, and the WebSocket worked. And um, I obviously am not going to just log in using my normal SMC credentials here, because this is a completely brand new SageMath cloud that's running just in this one directory. Carol, do you have a question? You can click on help and show that there are zero, zero active users. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. In, indeed. Zero. Okay. Um, zero users. So. The number of users is not updated instantaneously. It's updated about once per minute. So um, there isn't one me. OK, so I'll make an account. And you can do this as well if you want. Anyone who's a collaborator, the people who can access this URL and do something with it are exactly the collaborators on this project. It should be everybody in this room. Except, yeah, you're, even you're a collaborator on this project. So, um, so I will create an account. Get rid of this. Um, SMC demo. Email wstein at gmail.com. Password stage days. Too weak. No, it's just very weak. Okay. <laughs> stage days 5077. Okay, there we are. All right, so now I've signed in to my. SageMath Cloud, inside of SageMath Cloud, and it's listing my projects, of which I have none. Um, so there's projects, there's my account settings uh, here, look like this, and everything is, sort of, is reset to the default. Um, billing, Stripe isn't configured, so on the back end, the billing is done with Stripe. It's not configured, obviously, because this is a completely new installation. Um, and 
this stuff isn't configured. Well, I don't have any upgrades or anything. Okay, so now I'm in, and now I'll make a new project. So test, create the project. So normally in SageMath Cloud, each project runs as a separate user for security reasons. You don't want somebody to log in and type kill all dash nine and, and kill everything on the whole system. Um, here, that's impossible because a project, like this is all running as a single user in the same project. And so that's not allowed. Um, there's a list of four things, each of which I estimate will take two hours to fix. This is the second one. You've now seen two of them. Um, if you just do, if this happens the very first time you open a project. Um, but if you refresh again, then it'll work fine. And it did. And now, um, now we have, the, the URL gets very long because it's the normal URL to the project port in the port that the SageMath Cloud development server is running on. And then the same URL again, but for a different project. So it starts getting really long. And the obvious question is, can you do this repeatedly? Not yet. That's another one of the two hour things. There's a proxy server that um, enables things like the IPython notebook and serving a website from within SageMath Cloud projects. And I need to um, do a little more work to make that work from here. But once that's done, it will be possible to run SageMath Cloud and SageMath Cloud and SageMath Cloud. Um, it's the same thing that's used for displaying images and log tech documents and IPython notebooks and so on. Um, in any case, we can create a file and you know open a terminal, um, maybe mark a, make a markdown file. It's all there. Hey, what are you yep. Hey, you made a new project, and I am a collaborator. Awesome. Okay, that's an annoying bug. There's some bugs where like the UI sizing isn't right, and we've rewritten kind of, I don't know, from here down using React, and from there over. There's like, we're basically rewriting a lot of it in React, and certain bugs aren't worth fixing because they, will, they involve code that will just disappear. Um, I don't know, I probably deleted 20,000 lines of code in the last few months. It's really depressing. Okay, so here's another project, and then right here, see there's a terminal. The fun thing is, look at, if you look at print working directory, this is the normal path into the project that we started with at the left, and then inside of the thing we cloned, there's data projects and then a project ID. And so each of the, if you create a bunch of projects, they'll be in there. So if, we, if I go up one level and look, there it is. And of course, it's totally insecure. I can look at, I guess, Rob's project this way. Um, touch ABC. Now if I go over to SD70 test and then refresh this, ABC is now there. Okay, so all the projects are really just next to each other as the same user. All right, now I want to show you how to actually change something and see the result live. But let me list uh, some of the issues. Okay, I'm just going to quickly show you this. So these are the issues with doing development that I'm aware of. Uh, oh man, that's just insanely... Okay, it goes away. Okay, so first time, I already showed you that. You have to restart it the first time. This is a one-time only thing. Like Once it's created the database, once you're, you're good to go. Um, there's some issues involving installing some script system-wide because paths aren't properly set up to use the local ones. The problem here actually is that um, I'm using... In setup, in, uh, setup tools, you can create scripts, use via listing a bunch of things in, as entry points. Does anybody here know about that? It's really cool. You can have like two or three Python files and some li Python library, and you can say, hey, make a command line script that's the same as running this function in this Python library. And set of tools will automatically create that script. But um, the only way I know how to do that is to do pip install into some location, and then it creates a script. So I don't know how to do it with like Python set of py build or something like that. So if somebody wants to tell me how to do that, that would be cool. I hope it's I'm guessing it's just some options to pip that will install locally. Um, I already emphasized this. There's one security issue right now. There's a RethinkDB instance running on some random port on this computer. Anyone else with a project running on this computer, if they were to do some port scan and find that RethinkDB instance, could change the database. It does, but other other users on the same machine could connect to localhost. Yeah. There's an easy fix, which is setting a password, and there's full support for that, but I haven't automated it. It doesn't just happen when you try to start the first time. It should just set a random password. It's another two-hour thing. I only have so many two hours until I gave this talk, and here we are. 
I ran out of two hours. Um, so that's a problem. It's not a huge problem because it, even if they change the database and give themselves an account, they can't log in because they can't connect to the web server in the first place. So it actually doesn't expose anything at all. Um, so it's not a huge issue. It's just funny, I guess. It'll get fixed. Um, and you have to do some. You have to type some funny thing. If you change the Sage server itself, which I mean, it, it should automatically just notice that you changed it and do the right thing. But right now, you have to explicitly type this line. Um, and then the other thing I mentioned, you can't use IPython notebooks or LaTeX yet inside of this development mode because an additional thing has to be finished. Okay, now I'm going to show you how to change something. I made a list in the talk, and um, we'll have time to do maybe two of these things. So. Here are um, some things that you could change. In the front end, in the help page, it says support. You could change the word support to like a list of mom's favorites. It's just a completely arbitrary thing to change. Another thing we could do is on the back end, we can make it so that whenever you create an account, it changes the user's name to supermom. Another thing you could do would be whenever you open a, so each of these illustrates changing something in a different component of Sage Math Cloud. Um, another thing you could do would be uh, to change the local hub. So whenever you open a file, it puts hi mom at the very top of the file. So it inserts something. And another thing you could do is um, change it so that it puts hi mom into the terminal stream whenever you open a terminal. And that would illustrate changing code in the console server. There's a server that's dedicated to dealing with um, terminals. And another, uh, finally, you could change it. There's a Sage server. So it's a forking HTTP server that serves Sage worksheets and, or really Sage processes. And so you could change something in there. Okay, um, I actually explain how to do each of these things here, and I will show you live. Um, I'll, we'll say two different things. That's all I have time for. So first, I'll show you this one. We're going to change something in the front end, so that instead of saying support, it says something else. Maybe I'll do it a little bit differently here. So here's what we do. First, just to clarify what we're doing, here in support. Or in the help page, it has the word support right there. We're just going to change that. This will involve changing a little bit of um, stuff that's generated using React.js. We're going to change some code. Okay? And so uh, all of the code related to the front end web application is in SMC Web App. Let me zoom in a little. Um, SMC Hub, that is the backend web server that you know is at the bottom of the page and serves the web sockets and stuff. SMC Web App is the front-end client code. SMC Project, that's what runs um, each project itself. So in every project, there's a server sitting there running. There's some utility stuff, and um, there's SMC underscore SageWS. That's the Sage worksheet server. This is a now, pretty complicated collection of code that does things like um, has 3D graphics support. It um, has some parsing code. Um, right in here. Uh, it has a Julia mode. I don't have it included in Sage. But it should be. Uh, it has some mark markdown processing. Um, lots of little monkey patching. There's like tons of monkey patching in here, <laughs> um, et cetera. OK, so going up, let me just change one thing, as promised. So web app. And the help page is in help.cjsx. Looks like I have somehow moved this off the side of the screen. Oh, oh, right, yeah, I zoomed in. OK, so in here, search for support. Okay, here it is. So this is CoffeeScript code. There's a class, and one of its methods is render. And uh, I didn't put parentheses in the, for the function, so you don't have to put them in if there's like nothing there. But this takes nothing to, this is what's returned. So the, the uh, interesting thing here is that this looks like HTML. What it actually is is it's something called JSX which is an extension to JavaScript, or here really CoffeeScript, which lets you embed what looks like XML right in CoffeeScript or JavaScript, and it gets converted into calls against the React library. So this will do like react.createComponentDiv, 
and then it calls, and it just kind of, it's pretty straightforward transformation of this into a bunch of function so calls. Coffee script which compilers into normal JavaScript? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first, well, yeah. CoffeeScript just gets compiled to normal JavaScript. And the goal is that it's almost line by line. There's like a mapping. So it's supposed to be pretty straightforward. You almost never have to look at the corresponding JavaScript because of source maps. So when you're debugging and you see a traceback and stuff, it shows you the CoffeeScript, not the JavaScript, unlike Sage. Yeah. <laughs> we should have source maps in Sage. Um, it's a very standard idea in the JavaScript world that works super well and supported like all the places in all the tools. Yeah. We, we might want to look at what JavaScript people do with source maps and SAS. I mean, like all these transpiling systems use source maps, and they're supported really heavily all over the place, really well. They work. I don't know. You get tracebacks, stack traces. It just all it all works perfectly. And again, CoffeeScript is it's really a lot like the Sage preparser. It's just more complicated than the Sage preparser, but it's a sim very similar idea. Um, okay, so let's just change support to something else. So. Uh, how about I'll change it? Please help or uh, a random list of links. Okay, I save it. When I save it, notice that it turned orange for a second over here. That's telling us there's activity in that terminal. And what it did was it noticed that a, cha a file changed, and then it spent some time building it. It also builds source maps, and it generates all the corresponding JavaScript that has been modified. And there it is. Uh, it took three and a half seconds up here. And now, if we refresh the page, and it should work for you as well, then support should change to something else, a random list of links. With the hot reloading stuff that I mentioned, which is not live here yet, but is sort of supported in the um, React Webpack ecosystem, uh, it would have just instantly changed this, because it would have re-rendered this React component. But again, that's not uh, available yet. OK. By the way, if when I open a file, you want to see what I opened, there's a log in the project. That's the thing that looks like it's going back. And it has the word log next to it until you have too many tabs opened. Um, you can look there, and you'll see each file that anybody opened in order from when they opened it. And you can also search, like type William, and it shows just the things that I opened. And then you can click on this link to get it. Okay, that was the first thing I wanted to demo. I'm going to show you one more thing. Um, so let me close a few things. And, uh, oops, wrong thing. Pause. Okay, so summary of what we just did. To change a link, all you have to do is edit the file r underscore help cjsx. Everything else happens automatically if you refresh the page. Okay. The second thing I'm going to change is to change something in the backend hub. So we're going to open the file hub.copy, and we're going to find the place where it creates an account in the code, and we're just going to change the message that asked to create the account, and we're going to change the first and last name from whatever they happen to be to super com. Okay. So exit out of here. So um, hub.copy is in... SMC source SMC hub and it's unfortunately a rather large file like it's over 6,000 lines of CoffeeScript and since CoffeeScript like Python is very terse and you don't have to write a lot that's really way too big um, but in any case let's find um, well, let's do this so uh, there's a function called create account in here so create account equals, and here it is. So there's a message that comes in. Um, it has a bunch of fields. There's a file message.coffee, which documents exactly what the fields are. Um, but what we're going to do, is, since I already know, is right at the beginning, I'm just going to do message.firstname equals super, and message.lastname equals mom. OK, and then I'm going to save it. And now. This server that's at the bottom, I'm going to kill it. So I just stopped it, and then I'm going to start it up again. You don't have to compile anything. It's just done automatically. Um, it's now, it'll start running. And then what I'm going to do is log out and 
log back, or I'm going to create an account, and it's going to be funny because it's going to change my name without me asking it to do so. Okay, so sign out. You can also clear your cookies. Okay, and now I'm going to create an account. So I'm, of course, William, and I really want to make that emphasized. Um, Wstein at uw.edu. Um, some silly password. And now I create my account. And what the heck? It's converted me to Supermom. So that illustrates changing something in the back end hub server. Uh, in the slides, which I am now out of time to talk about, there are a couple of other things. Let me just very briefly show you those without actually doing them. So changing the local hub. Um, in this one, you change the file localhub.copy, and then you restart a project, and then it'll run the new version of the code. And here are the exercise, so to speak, is to add these words to the beginning of any file that you open. And what you do is you just look in the code for where it opens a file, and turns it into a string, like where it reads in a file, and just add the string at the beginning. Okay. Uh, another one, there's a terminal server, and the process in which your console actually runs is um, console server child .copy. And so if you just put it at the very bottom after it's initialized everything, socket.write hi mom, then it will, will um, send that to the front end. So there's that. And for changing the Sage server, um, all the code is in smc sage ws slash whatever. So the main Sage server is in sage server.py. And if you look through the file, there's a certain place um, where a lot of monkey patching occurs. And so maybe I'll give in the next talk. Uh, let me out of here. I'll show you that file. SMC source. SMC underscore sage WS. And then inside of that, this is a standard Python module with uh, dist util or setup tools. And then sage server.py. And then to know that you're in uh, SMC, it sets this variable underscore underscore sage WS equals true. But, um, whoops. You can see. The unfortunate monkey patching of, say, LaTeX pretty printing with my own version, all kinds of other namespace stuff. Mm -hmm. So hopefully this will all go away, sort of. These are all the symbols that get added in or replaced when you run Sage in a Sage worksheet in Sage Math Cloud. And many of these are functions that are defined uh, in other files next to this one. So for example, for making R plots appear nicely. You might have remembered a recent discussion on the list by Andre about that. Okay. And with that, I am done. Any questions? So somebody makes a project within, or a server within the server, yep. and comes back to it weeks later, how much do they have to update? And how much will it change out from underneath them? Or does it? Uh, what's it? The, the, the environment that they want to work in. I mean, they have to pull the a repo, they got updates so on JS. They don't have to. I mean, the files are all exactly the same. Right, but you want to catch up. It, with... I might have not done any development at all, okay. or I might have done. I mean, I just, I just curious about it's possible that there's anywhere between, I guess, no changes at all to SMC over two weeks to ten thousand lines changed. I don't know. I mean, it's, it depends on the two week period. It doesn't exist yet. Uh, well, this seemed like there were a lot of things that were updating themselves. Uh, yes, so for example, uh, just to address that, if, so that, but that's all, so um, if you quit all of this and then came back two weeks later and just started it again, it would be exactly the same. But if you then did git pull and then um, you would want to type npm run make, and what it'll do is if any packages have been updated, It'll download and install the new versions of those packages. So you're asking about? That's, yeah. that's the kind of thing I was wondering what, how many steps you have to do. I think it would be npm run make. Because that just runs it in all the sub packages. And it, it again, it's like setup py in that it looks at all the versions that you set um, of packages that you want to depend on. And it gets the latest versions that match the semantic versioning that's specified there.
Okay. All right. I am now shutting things down. So why why are you um, changing bar? Changing what? Bar. Function bar. Function bar. I don't know. You can look at the code and see. <laughs> Um, I had a problem with it. No, I wish I did. Um, I don't remember. It was this was not surprisingly one of the first things I changed. Oh, it's um, in SageMath Cloud worksheets. There's a notion of uh, percent modes. You know, like in Sage, in Sage NV or I or. Um, I Python where you can do like in I Python you do double percent and then something. Um, in yeah, magic commands, that's what they're called I Python. In Sage there's magic commands also, and I wanted to have a bar magic command. So, yeah, one, one so I had to very slightly wrap it. I think it makes sense to have that in Sage. Uh yeah, but the implementation might be different. Yeah. That's the problem. So it, the way magic commands work in SageMath Cloud is really pretty simple. Any function at all that takes as input a string, is you can just use it as a magic command by putting percent this, in front of it. This could like so. Suppose I, I have some Sage scripts that yep. uses bar, and I yep. use it on SMC. Maybe it breaks. Shouldn't. It's not. It's not like I've changed a lot. Um, like here's the difference. It's just calling the built-in one, but yeah. it does something special when it's passed a string. So actually, it probably could just be used in, it probably, I mean, this is the grand total of every, of all the changes. Um, I think maybe the main problem is this LaTeX. I want to be able to do this. So what that, what this does is it passes options. It makes a uh, cell decorator with some options, basically. And I don't think the same one would make there's a certain situation where I want the bar command to return a function that takes as input a string. Basically, I want it to return a bar command, but with certain options fixed. So that's what this is doing. And I don't really know if that's needed in Sage, but it's very useful here. Or people care a lot. They want to be able to set a bunch of LaTeX options. Um, so I'm not sure how the, the LaTeX names thing, I guess that doesn't uh, uh, I see. It's just kind of a convenience. I guess the normal var in SMC, I mean in Sage, you would pass LaTeX names in at the end. Because I'm just looking at the source code and seeing that that's what it does. It's just, it doesn't, I, the, I'm making a very, very cosmetic change so I can use this notation in a Sage worksheet, which Sage NB, IPython, etc. don't even have, a, they have no notion of a, of a notation like that. Let me illustrate this so you see what the heck I'm talking about. What that does is make it so that, um, I guess, I don't know if it works in MathJax. Yeah, it does look. So I made a green theta. So basically, you can define variables and ever after with, with this sort of very SMC like notation percent decorator, some options that you pass in, and then um, the actual list of variables. So theta. Psi, beta, etc., and then when you use them, they get oh, cannot specify LaTeX name for multiple symbol names. Okay, I guess you have to do each one separately, because um, look, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. It's a very sensible error message. Uh. I guess three is not green, but anyways, it doesn't do very much. I've answered your question, and now I'm done. <laughs> Any other questions while I close up? Okay.